You want to hand me the letter? You took my copy. I did take your copy, and yeah. I brought a fresh copy. Oh, oh, okay. You're in. Okay, come on. All right. Stay back down. Go on. Go on back. I knew that was going to be the case. She wants to know what's going on. She's yeah. a little girl. It's <laughs> interesting to her to find out. She'll have something to talk about. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to be in the other box. Yep. Why don't we just start with why we came, right? Okay. Okay. Um, why don't you, you know, just what you were doing yeah. before in the house when you showed... Okay. Okay. Now? Yeah. All right. Uh, I want you to look at this, Mert, and see if this is your father's handwriting. This is a letter that was written to the president back in 1933. You should know whether that's his handwriting or not. He signed this letter with five other people. Yes, this is my father's handwriting. And there's his signature there. Sam, Sam Witherspoon. So. Yes, this is his. Well, you know, I, I like I said earlier, I knew him, but I didn't know that he had wrote to the president at that time. But I wish I had known it. Maybe we could have had something that we could have talked about, and maybe I'd know more about this than I do now. But I do remember him saying that he made 22 cents an hour. My dad worked in the mill, and he made 22 cents an hour also. But... I can remember even when my dad had got up to 32 cents an hour. And it's amazing to me that how they raised a family and did the things they did with that 22 cents an hour. Uh, but somehow or other it happened. I guess it was the Lord with them and because my father believed that the Lord was in charge. And I guess your father probably did the same thing. Yes, he raised a family of six yeah. and brought a home with 22 cents an hour. Okay, now I have a question. Now the first time... Now I know your father worked in the mill, but did you know about this letter? No, I didn't know about the letter. My, uh, at all. But I am very excited that my dad wrote the president. You know, it's a good thing that this letter come up. Before I gave you this this letter, uh -huh. did you? I mean, did you have any? Did you know anything about this? And could you just sort of talk about bringing this over here? I mean, the names that you saw. Yeah, you want yeah. me to start with yeah, that? Yeah, let's just. Right. I mean, let's just start with the honest truth. Where? Because that's where, where, where I started when I first when Connie first gave me the letter. Yeah. I read the letter and then I looked at the signatures immediately. I recognized the name of Sam Witherspoon and Tom Stroud because those were some people that I knew. I knew that Sam Witherspoon had died. I didn't know that Tom Stroud had died. But whenever I thought of Sam Witherspoon, I said he had some children that lived down in the 73 area. And I'll run down there and see if I can find any of them. So when I got to checking around, somebody said, well, Mert lives down there. So I come down to see Myrtle. And when I showed her this letter, I asked her if she knew anything about it. She said, my dad wrote the president? Yes, I was very excited because I knew my daddy was a brilliant man, but I didn't know I have an idea that he wrote the president. That is his handwriting. You sure? I'm positive. There is Sam with a spoon, and that is his W and his S. <laughs> That is his handwriting. Well, you know, most of the men that worked in the cannon mills during that time, they had the, what I call the menial jobs of opening the cotton bales and getting the cotton ready to run through a machine. As a matter of fact, that's what my father did. But I don't know, to write the president, that's, that's something that I never, never would have even imagined that could have happened. Because nowadays, you try to write to president, you got to go through the National Guard and everybody else in order to get a letter in. 
<laughs> could you just tell me something about? Could you could you could you tell me? Yeah, yeah. My daddy worked in the mill, and just tell me a little bit about what you know he did. Yes, you ready? Yeah. My dad worked in the mill over forty years, and he was a a baler. He baled cotton. And he often talked about his job. He was interested in his job, and he really did a job. He wasn't out at any time other than sickness or death. And he had us to come along and do the thing that he did. Don't be afraid of a job. Do the job and do it right. That was his uh, motto. And. They had to raise the family off for 22 cents an hour. Well, you know, at that time, you know, why don't you read that letter? All right. The letter says, we are writing you in regard, dear Mr. President, we are writing you in regards to our wages. The company is paying all the other people more money but us. We are only getting 22 cents an hour now. We cannot live at that. And can you please help us some? For we have asked for a raise, but did not get it. They will not pay the colored people anymore, and we have a family to keep up. Thank you very much. And it's signed by six men, Lewis Davis, James Dry, Sam Witherspoon, Doc Jackson, Tom Stroud, and Paul Means. Do you know any of these other men, or have you ever heard of any of these other men? I've heard tell of Paul Means and Mr. Tom Stroud. But to meet them, I never met him. But I've heard Daddy talk much about him. Well, I was fortunate to meet Tom Stroud through his daughter, Mildred, who, and both of them are dead now. Mildred has a daughter that moved away from the area, and I can't find anybody who knows anything about her or where she might be now. But Tom and Mildred both are dead, and that's the only people in that family I know. These other people I have, I do not know, but I'm going to do all I can to try to find out something about them, if I possibly can. Well, listen, do you know, um, well, you were, when this was written, actually, why don't you hold that letter in your hand? And I want you to, I want you to read that letter. You say, you say your daddy, this is your daddy's handwriting? Yes. For the letter, too? Yeah. Tell me that and, and read that letter. I guess I can read it without my glasses. <laughs> you ready? This is my dad's handwriting. Dear Mr. President, we are writing you in regards to our wages. The company is paying all of the uh, other people more money but us. We are only getting 22 cents an hour now. And the, and we cannot live at that. I, and can you please help us? For we have homes and family to raise. But didn't get it. They will not pay us. They pay the colored people anymore. And we have families to keep up. Thank you very much. And then it says it's over, and it has six other people, Lewis Davis, Jane Dry, Sam with the Spoon, Doc Jackson, Tom Scrout, and Paul Means. What do you think when you look at that? Well, I think it's amazing because uh, you can't hardly get a letter to the president nowadays. <laughs> and back then, I don't know how in the world it got there. It's just amazing that it reached the president's desk. And Roosevelt was president at the time. So that's been some years ago. That was a little before your time, too, Myrtle, because at that time I was only three years old. And uh, I'm a little older than you are. Yeah. So that was before your time. And uh, President Roosevelt had just been made the president in 1932. Uh, he became president in 1932, and he started a new era where he had made some new rules and new regulations where people working would get more money. And that's what I suppose all of this letter was about, wondering why that the blacks weren't included in the new job plan. 
because I think then the black workers were working 10 to 12 hours a day. And uh, what they had done, they had cut everybody down to an eight hour day. And I think that the blacks were still doing those long hours and getting very little pay. So it was before your time, but I'm sure back then it was a struggle. I don't know, I would just think it would be an awful struggle on 22 cents an hour. I just can't imagine that. <laughs> what do you, I mean, did your, I mean did, did your father ever talk to you about his job? I mean, and, and particularly in terms of, I mean, I know that Cannon Mills and Concord was a, was a real mill town. But to write a letter like that, what does that mean? Well, it meant, <laughs> could you, you know, could you hold that letter for a second? And uh, I mean, and you could, you don't have to move it a whole, a whole lot around, but I'm just, I mean, think about what it means to, um, to, to, to write a letter, a protest around Cannon Mills, about Cannon Mills in 1933. Well, I think he. He was eager to work, but he wanted more money because he wanted his family to have the best. And he knew he couldn't do it without a little more money. And when he was performing the job, and I think he just had um, just enough uh, <laughs> smart to uh, just write the president and asked the president to tell the president what what he what it was all about, you know, what and how he felt about his job. But he signed his name, and so did these other men. Well, that was showing that they wasn't afraid. That's all I can say. It was uh, that they knew they were doing the job that the white was doing, and they thought they should have had more money. These were probably some men that he knew very closely. Working with them, they probably developed a beautiful friendship. And they probably said, let's do it together. And then one wrote it and the other signed it in order to say, we're all together in this and together we might get more yeah. done than we would if just one of us would sign it. I would think that that would be yeah together the we stand and together that divided <laughs> we fall yeah and it was probably all the men who worked in that department at that time because usually there were only four or five blacks in a department together at a time they didn't put a lot of people there and I say this from what I know about the mill they didn't put a lot of blacks in one area no they tried to scatter them out as much as they possibly could. And these were probably the only men that he worked closely with. Yes. Now, could you talk about the control? I mean, I know that you were, you weren't born yet. You were born a year later. I was 59. born in 35. You were born in 35. So mm -hmm. you were born two years after this letter was written. Yeah. Um, did you, uh, did you know anything? I mean, did, did you ever hear your father talk about his work in the mill, did you, I mean, or what it meant to be, at that time, a black man working in, at, in Cannon Mills? Yes, um, Dad had worked in the mill ever since he was, I think he said he was 17 years old when he went to the mill. And uh, he walked to and from work every day. And he never was out. And he bailed cotton all those years. Um, he would talk about bailing the cotton, how he shift the gears on the the machine and everything, and uh, open cotton, bail them, and so on. So we knew all about his job because he would bring it home with him every day. <laughs> but he was just an outstanding man to watch his job, home, and neighborhood. Well, do you think? that by him bringing it home with him every day, he was complaining, or was he proud that he had that type job? Well, really and truly, I think he was proud of his job. That's, at, that's Because at the time, you, you was lucky to have a job, especially a job paying no more than 22 cents an hour.
because most people were farmers at that time. What does this letter represent to, 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 to both of you? I mean, you were born here. These are your people who wrote this letter. And it's a letter of protest. I would say that it was one of the first protests that the blacks in this area. Could you refer to this? Could you refer to this to this letter? I mean, you could. She could. Myrtle yeah. can hold this. It, refer this, to this letter. letter and look up a little. Okay. Too. This letter to me was one of the first protests that the blacks ever did in this area that I know of. I can't remember or ever hear of any other protest that the blacks made. And this was a, a protest, even though it was in writing, it was a sign that things were not going well. And things were not going well at that time with the, not only these men, with all of the men in this area who worked. It was not going well. And these men had the gumption and the common sense and the audacity, audacity to come out and say it where most of them suffered in silence and never said anything about it. I think had it been maybe known about this letter, maybe a lot more people might have signed this letter or might have been along with this group of folk. But this was a group who decided in the, among themselves that this is what we're going to do about it. How do you feel about it? Well, I feel the same way, and I think it was just really great that they had that Sorry, much spunk. Can, can you start that again? Um, can you say could you, could you say, yeah. Yes, I think it was great uh, that they had this much spunk and whatever to, to tell somebody about it, to write about it, and to explain their feeling. Because it takes a lot of guts to do this, you know <laughs> what I mean? Yeah. I'm and sure it did. I think it's just wonderful. Well, at any rate, whether anything come from it at that time or not, I still believe it was a good idea. And it gives me the idea that maybe instead of just taking things as it comes, maybe I need to say something about some things sometimes that are not going well. Or you need to say some things, something about some things that are not going well. You still work in the mill, and I'm sure the conditions aren't. They're not what they're supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> but, I can assure you. But but but, still nobody, still nobody else complains because this is the only, like I say, the only complaint that I have ever heard of about conditions at Cannon Mill. And I've lived in this area off and on for the last 60, 65 years almost, and I never heard of any other complaint. So maybe, maybe this should, I well, don't know. <laughs> well, they still doesn't have equal rights. They, uh, it is said to have equal rights, but we still doesn't have equal rights. Well, I, I'm sure. Uh, it's partial, but uh, uh, not all the way. I'm sure that it is, and uh, this, this led up to something else, I'm sure, but right now, Looking at this, it just lets me know that we have always had those courageous folk who always wanted things to be better. And my dad used to tell me often that if you want something to change, you have to do something about it. Yes. And that's, I think, the idea that these men might have had, that they wanted a change and they were willing to stick their necks out to try to bring about some change. That's great. Now, you know, back then, in 19, 1933, just, they wrote this letter after, you know, the National Recovery Act, that the thing that gave us the eight-hour day and the 40-hour work week and the minimum wage, that went into effect right before they wrote this letter. Is that, when you read this letter, did you write the, did you read the date? Yeah. January 13th, 1933. The address is Cannon Mills, plant number okay. six. You know what? Even say, and I, you know, and I, I never knew about this. 
and I still work at the mill, so. Right, so you want another double? No, it's a double. No. Okay, whenever you're ready. Okay. This letter says, Concord, North Carolina, January 13, 1933, Cannon Mill, plant number six. Dear Mr. Roosevelt, we are writing you in regard to our wages. The company is paying all the other people more money but us. We're only getting 22 cents an hour now, and we cannot live at that. And can you please help us some? For we have asked for a raise but did not get it. They will not pay the colored people anymore, and we have a family to keep us, to keep up. Thank you very much, and it's signed by Lewis Davis, James Dry, Sam Witherspoon, Doc Jackson, Tom Stroud, and Paul Means. Our job is running machine, cotton machines, pressers. That's my daddy. <laughs> yeah. That's Sam with the spoon. That's his handwriting. And we still work in the mill. And I still work in the mill, and things are not like they're supposed to be. Well, uh, maybe somebody else needs to write a letter. I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe that might be the answer. I don't know, but I will. Uh, you wouldn't write to the president though this day and time. Now, do you think? Can you stop? Okay. Do Do you think that um? You think that this got around? I mean, do you think that at the time most people? Could Could you describe to me the control? in this town at the time and what it meant to sign your name to a letter of complaint. I mean, we're talking about Concord and Kannapolis. I really believe that this was kept a secret because had this got around, these people would have been out of a job. These people would have been out of a job and probably a lot more colored people who might have sympathized with them after they found out what was going on. Because at that time, the cook, the, the, the whole Cabarrus County was under a great deal of control where blacks were concerned and still is to, a, to an extent. But back then, blacks writing something to the president, it would have been terrible, the repercussions that might have. And I'm sure most of these people who signed this letter would have been out of a job. And the thing about it, they wouldn't have been able to work for Cannon Mills anymore during their lifetime because they had something to happen similar later on in years, and some of those people now can't work cannon mills. And yeah. what? Yes, because when the union was there, and some of them got fired behind the union. Yeah, even to try to unionize. I'm sorry, I started to cut you off. Oh. Just saying that even, that even now. When the union, you know. Yeah, because we have the union now. And some of them lost their job behind the union. So I think back then, if they had a, they wouldn't have been able to work for the company at all. Well, you don't have a union. You try to get a union, yeah. union right? Yeah. Were you a part of that too? Well, yes, I voted. But you didn't have to tell which way you voted, but you <laughs> voted. And, um, but it didn't go through. We don't know what you're, what you're referring to, so. The union. Okay, okay. Let me, I'll let this car go by. We were talking about it in the letter. You were just saying that signing your name to a protest. I mean, this is, it's not, it wasn't just, the control wasn't just for blacks, it was for all people who oh, lived yeah. in the mill town, right? Yeah, the mill was in control of all of the people. And that was, I think, part of the reason that they, didn't, that they didn't pay them any more money than they did. Because they felt like if we pay you more money, you might get out of our control, and we won't be able to control you. But if we give you just enough to make a living, we don't have to worry about you too much. And I think that was the whole idea behind the low-paying wage, was to keep everybody under control, that you don't go out and do something that we wouldn't want you to do. Because if you don't have the money, there's not much you can do. Talking about control, I mean, could you refer to the letter in terms of challenging control and what what you both think that, that meant at the time and what it means now? Well, at the time that this letter was written to, to do this, to do something like this showed that 
they were willing to buck the control, willing to go against the norm and do something on their own, which is something that's a great idea, don't care who it is. But to be black and do something like this, it meant a lot. It means a lot to me to know that there were blacks who had that much uh, forward look that they wanted to do something about the conditions that they were under. Because I, I can remember even back in slavery, a lot of people in slavery, they didn't want to get out of slavery because they were satisfied. They had become complacent. And that's what has happened with a lot of the people that worked in County Mill in those days. They were complacent and they didn't worry about change or what would make it better for them. They were just glad to get whatever they could get. But you see, most of them lived in Cannon's houses. Yeah. And my my dad didn't live in Cannon House. And none of these men here no. had a part of Cannon House, so they were struggling for them, themselves. So this is why I think they wanted more money so they could survive a little better. But the fact that they also uh, lived in their own house, that meant that they couldn't get evicted, didn't they? Right. Could you, I mean, maybe that maybe that has a connection with why they signed their names. Could you, could you, could you make that connection for me? Well, I think uh, one reason why they had uh, enough spunk about themselves to write the president and to describe how they felt about things was because they owned their own. They was buying their own. And they knew at the time that they couldn't be thrown out of the house. Maybe they would have got out of a job, but if they felt like it was some way they could have survived and finished paying for their job, their house. So I think this is one reason why they went on and wrote letters and signed their name. Here again, you got to refer back to that control. I know a lot of the things that were going on that maybe some people don't know about. But wh uh, when you talk about that control, that living in the man's house that you worked for, he really had you under control. Because if you did anything that he didn't like, he could put you out of the house, He'd take your job, and where were you going to go? Especially if you've got five, six children. Because five or six children, you don't just take them out and live out on the street like people do now. But these men, a lot of them realized this and were afraid in some instances to speak out too much. But like you say, these men owned their own homes. They had jobs. They figured, I'll make it some way or other. Well, my dad has always been a very strong man, and he said, what he meant, and he meant what he said. Well, I know that. And that's the way we grew up. And if he said he was going to do something, he did it. Well, Regardless. When I, even when I dealt with you and your brother as children, I found that out. Because if he said we aren't going anywhere, we didn't go anywhere. <laughs> that was true. <laughs> Why didn't your father take that letter for a second? Why didn't your father tell you about this? Uh, he would just sit down and we would ask him things concerning his job, especially after we got up some size, you know, and my brothers got large enough to go in the mill. And he would ask them, is this, is you sure this is what you want to do in life? Then he would tell them what a tough time he had in life by working under these circumstances. But he said, I made it by the grace of God. But now, if this is what you want to do the rest of your life, it's your choice. And he really talked to us about the job and going into the mill as a career. Because he wanted us to better ourselves if there was a possibility. Rather than go into this career. But I have one brother that's a mechanic. I has another one that work at the chemical plant. I has a sister that work at UNCC. And I has a sister work at the VA hospital in Salisbury. I am the only one that's at Canna Mill. So, 
It looked like I didn't take his word. <laughs> I didn't take his word. So what's his word there? Uh, I just, I didn't take it for granted, you know, like, whether you want to make your career here, it looked like I chose this as a career. But could you say this now? I mean, think about it. You work in the mills. Yeah. Your daddy worked in the mills. Your daddy's talking to you maybe through this letter, isn't he? Yes, could you, yeah. Could you, if you believe what I said, could you say that and, and talk about that? Yeah, daddy told me, uh, well, in this letter he's telling you that um, how, you know, the pay would be and how um, the black people were treated and still is treated. And uh, <laughs> But I didn't, I didn't take it like that. I just went on because I didn't further my education like my other sisters and brothers. They furthered their education other than this high school. And I didn't do that, so I had to take the next higher and pay thing, you know, to survive. Murda, what, what is your, is your father just talking about wages and hours here, is, or is he talking about something else? Well, he's talking about, well, you can make a living there. That's what he, he's really saying, you can make a living there, but it wouldn't be as great a one as you would if you would further your education. Okay, no, but I mean, by, by the, just because he wrote that letter, because he had that gumption, I'm quoting you, to write that letter, is he... Is he just talking, in the very act of writing it, is he just talking about wages and hours, or is he saying something in the act of writing it? You know what I mean? Well, he's telling me that you have to stand up for your rights, and I do, <laughs> regardless. I do. I mean, it may cause a little heartache sometimes, but what I say, I mean it. And I will not take it back. And I don't care who is with you, you, or who. Uh, if I feel like I'm right, I'm right. And I'm not going to take it back because, you you know, to make you feel well about it. Now, I want you to look at that letter. And you know what? Do you want me to take your cigarettes for a second? <laughs> I'll put that in. Yeah, okay. But told me you wrote this letter. So what he's telling me by writing this letter is stand up for my rights, and then go with that. Do you, you know what I mean? Okay. I just want you to say what you said again, but I want you to refer directly to this letter, and then 60 years later, what he's trying to say to you in that. Well, my daddy wrote this letter in 33, yeah, and I never knew about this letter. But since reading the letter, to me, he's telling me to stand up for my rights and to let people know how I feel about things and hold to, to that point, you know. Because now, a day you're supposed to have equal rights. Whether we get it or not, you still have that to go on. And you have people standing behind you now when 30 year, 33 years ago, it wasn't anybody behind you. But you got people standing behind you if you're right nowadays. So I think Dad is just telling me here that whatever fear you take in life, to stand up for your rights. And things will go well, you know. Will they? I think so. Things will go very well if you stand up and let a person know who you are and what you for. Now, do you think it would have made a difference to a lot of the people who have worked in the mills, a lot of the black people who worked in the mills, if they'd known maybe about a letter like this? And use my question in your answer. You can both answer. I think if this letter. I believe had this letter been made more public, uh, some of the people who worked at the mill would have been more energetic about doing something about the conditions. Uh, people like to be a follower. Nobody wants to be a leader. And now that they've already got leaders, some other people would have followed them 
and maybe more could have been done or something could have been done. And I keep thinking about this letter and evidently this letter was not made a public issue. And the reason for that, it might have been, like I said earlier, afraid of job reprisals or something of that nature. But had this letter been made public, I think the whole thing would have went over a whole lot different to what it has gone now. Well, and when I say different, maybe the wages would have been raised earlier, maybe the conditions would have been changed earlier, and people would have gotten more out of their work. But the people who worked in the cannon mills back in those days, they were proud to work in cannon mills. They were real proud folk. They were proud that they had a job that they didn't have to farm any longer. And most of these people who had gone to work in the mill come from farming families. And here's something that I don't have to work from sun up until sundown, and if the rain doesn't come or the sun doesn't shine, I won't have nothing at the end. And most of the people in this area who were farmers then were sharecroppers anyway, and they didn't get much out of what they farmed for. And these people that worked in the mill were a, st a cut above those people who were farmers because they had an income which was year-round. Where on the farm, you only had an income at the end of the season. And then you owed most of that back to the man who had started you off in the spring. But my dad never did farm. And he always told us, oh, uh, well, as children, we would go to our grandmother's house and see molasses, stuff like that. We asked him to buy molasses. He said, I had enough of it when I was a child. We didn't get anything like that. We didn't go bare feet. We wasn't allowed to go bare feet or anything because Daddy put shoes on our feet. And we were a proud family. We didn't have to go out here and pick cotton. I never have picked a boy of cotton in my life. And my daddy always worked, and my mother worked public. And we, we never farmed. So. So your father was a kid. Oh, like I say, there was a little group maybe worked. Back in the 1930s, when this letter was written, and possibly a little further back, because my father started to work in 1927, he was hired as a bail opener. That was the job he was hired for in 1927. And in the group where he worked, there was five of them, all black. And they all worked in this one little room. There were some in there that hauled in the cotton, there was some in there that opened the cotton bales, and there was some that put the cotton in the machines, and then there was some that took the waste out of machines. It was about five of them. And those five men worked together just about the 50 years that my father worked in the mill. And, and, and in maybe they had, in the mill they had like a number one, a number two, a number three, a number four, a number five, a number six, a number seven. No, these are just sections. And maybe the number one section, they had an opening room, a weave room, and a card room. Same thing for the number two section. Same thing for all of the sections. If you worked in the opening room of number one, you worked in the opening room for number one as long as you were in the mill. But how many, what I'm trying to, how many, I mean, the, the mill. The I say it'd be four, white. yeah, it'd be four or five blacks in the opening room. That was just about the extent. Could you make a generalization? Could you say how many mills there were here in the area and maybe how many, you know, percentage of how many blacks there were? Well, in the area that were, that were, when you talk about mills now, you're talking about there was a lock mill, there was a cannon mill, and there was a Gibson mill when you talk about mills. But with the cannon mill, they had departments in cannon mills numbered one through eight departments. And each department made a different thing. There were some departments that made towels. There were other departments that made sheets. There were other departments that made different things. But they had in that, they had an opening room, a card room, a picker room, a spinning room, and a weave room. 
like in number one, they had all of those in the number one section. And, in, and of all of that, of and all of that you things. might have, and all of that you might have seven blacks in that whole thing. Section. Right, and, but as, of an, as, a, as in a general, as a, in a generalization, maybe fifty blacks in that whole department, in that whole meal, fifty, maybe a hundred blacks in the whole meal out of possibly seven or eight hundred people. And the blacks only did the lower paying menial jobs. There were no black weavers at that time. There were no black spinners at that time. There were no black card hands at that time. There were no black picker hands at that time. Only blacks worked in the part where they opened the cotton, got the cotton ready, to make the first thread. They handled a raw cotton. That's what the blacks did. And back in 1933, I'm sure that's what they were doing because they were doing that in 1946. Because I went to work in that department in 1946, breaking up the bales for the first thread. I worked about two months and I couldn't handle it any longer. <laughs> Doing a doubt, I mean, writing a letter like that, what, I mean, if you wrote that and your supervisor saw it, what would that mean? Or if the boss saw it, I mean, why were you writing to the president? You would, they wouldn't ask you that. You just would be fired probably on the spot. Could you say, if, could, could both of you talk about that, as far as you know? I mean, about if they knew that you'd written a letter like this? I, 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 I feel that if they had known that you'd write a letter to the president or write a letter to anybody, not only the president, to anybody complaining about the conditions, you would no longer be working there. And you would be what they call blackballed. In other words, you would never be able to work for Cannon Mills under any circumstances again. Now, that's the way I feel about this. And that's possibly why this letter was not widely known. Even though these men had to stand up to do it, but I don't think they wanted it known that they did it. I don't believe they did. How about I you? don't know because <laughs> Daddy was a little different. Um, Daddy didn't care. I mean, <laughs> if he felt like it was something he that needed to be out in the open, he would say it would regardless to what the outcome would be. I mean, he would say it. Uh, he said, "Well, if that job goes, say God will give me strength to get another job," and that's the way he felt about things. And I believe he would have stuck his head out, regardless uh, whether everybody knew about it or whether they didn't. Now, did you, did you, um, you know, this was written right after the end, right after they put the NRA in Pittsburgh. And apparently, you know, they believed that they were supposed to get minimum wage, 30 cents an hour. And I think that's why they wrote this letter, because all the other people were getting 30 cents an hour, and they thought, because they were running machines, yeah. they should get it too. But there was other black people in other different communities that also wrote letters, they didn't know about this one, I don't think, saying the same thing, saying, hey, you finally passed this legislation that's for all people, what about us? Mm -hmm. So, what, what you're saying is uh, that he knew about the it had, it had, uh, the wages had been passed, you know, that they were supposed to make more, and they hadn't received there, so that's why I think he just gave up and just said, well, well, what the heck? I, I'm not getting it anyway. Why not let somebody know about it? You know? So I feel like this is why they went on and they didn't have nothing to lose. They wasn't gaining anything from it, but they didn't have anything to lose. I think that they might have thought they were going to. I think they thought they were going to gain something from it was the reason they wrote the letter. It wasn't that they figured they wouldn't. They figured by writing this letter, this would draw the attention to the fact that, hey, they are part of us down here who aren't getting anything. We all ought to get it or nobody get it. And I think this is why the letter was written, to say, because it says they were paying other people more money. Yeah. Which is saying that, why not me too? 
Yeah, I and, mean, and, and I think too. this I think this is what this letter was about. And like I say, the only thing they were worrying about was why don't we get paid the same as everybody else because we're working just like they are. Yeah, well, that's and 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 I think that was the whole reason for this letter, and just happened these men were the ones who did it. And I may and it may be some others who might have done the same thing. But this is just the one maybe that was found. At the time that they were doing this, so a lot there was a there was a lot of union organization going on here in Canapolis and Concord. And that was one of the first times that they started to heavily organize the union. Did you did you know about that? No, I didn't know about that. In fact, I didn't know anything concerning the letter to the union or anything until Lawrence was telling me. Well, now, about the union, my mother was the one who told me about that. My mother said they even had a strike, and they opened a union store, a store where the people who were members of the union could go and get grocery free of charge. And during that time, my mother said she was privileged to go to the store one time. She only went one time. And of course, I, I feel that the reason, I, this is my own thinking, I didn't ask her, but I think the reason she didn't go to the store anymore is because of the location of the store. The location of the store, what we would call back now, redneck area. But back then it wasn't redneck, it was just pure white and your blacks just didn't go there. Uh, it was in the area of where the new food line is downtown. The store was in that area on the opposite side of the street, and my mother went to it because for years the store still remained there. I don't know whether it's there now, because when we grew up, it was still called the Union Store, although it was no longer the Union Store. And during the time of that strike, they even brought the National Guard into Kannapolis. And they put the National Guard there to ensure the workers freedom in going and coming from work. And they had the workers, the National Guard, to stand on the tops of the cannon mill building with guns to make sure well, that's that people my time. <laughs> to make sure that people got to work safely. And during the day, some of the black workers in the cannon mills had to take water up to the top of the buildings to give those National Guardmen drink during the day so that they didn't dry out while they were standing there. Well, I can't remember Daddy saying that uh, if they didn't carry their water, they carried their water to work. I know. Because there were no fountains for the black people to drink out of. They, uh, and if you didn't carry water with you, you didn't have any. They had fountains for whites, but they didn't have fountains for blacks. How did you I said, you can't quote me too much on this because I might be run out of town for talking about the conditions that were going at Cannon Mills. And also at Cannon Mills, they didn't even have inside toilets for black people at that time. They had black people who cleaned up inside toilets for white people, but they weren't allowed to use that toilet. If they wanted to use the toilet, they had to come outside the building to an outhouse that sit out by itself and all kinds of weather or whatever, and use the restroom. But they cleaned the bathrooms for the white folk, but the black folk had to go outside, and they had one or two spaced around the cannon mills inside the fence that blacks had to use. Where I was talking about the bathrooms outside, and they had to clean the toilets, and they had to clean the toilets for the whites. Okay, well, you could, um, you, could, you could start with that. Okay. And if you can make the connection between that kind of segregation, control, and then, again, maybe given all that, what it meant to uh, to stand up for yourself yeah. back at that time, it's really um, something. Yeah. And uh, this was going on as late as 1948. It still had not changed considerably. But then after the early 50s and the sit-in demonstrations and all that, it began to change. But even then, there were some things that were not going well because the black man was still the lowest paid man on the totem pole. Because I worked in cannon mills for those two months, I only received a dollar an hour 
And, and in comparison to that and what happened in 1933, there was very little difference because we still didn't make the money that we needed to support our families. Of course, we did with the help of God, but without that, we wouldn't have been able to make it. And back in 1933, I feel like it was even harder to make it then. Of course, things were a lot cheaper then because you could take a nickel and go and get a whole lot of flour for a nickel, or you could go and get three, four eggs for a nickel. Yeah, you were saying in 1933 you just you made the connection between segregation and conditions in the mills and then you were gonna you were talking about that and you were gonna just so that we could understand the context in which they were writing this yeah well in the same context a, a letter was needed after that also okay but let's just talk about 1933 just well 1933 I, know, I mean and you can say look I wasn't around but I know I was three years old at the time. In 1933, I was three years old. That was during the time of the Depression. The Depression ended around 1930, which had been a hard time for everybody. But then in 1933, conditions were beginning to get a little bit better because the NRA had been established and all of this was going, was supposed to change to benefit all citizens in the United States same as it is now. The Civil Rights Act of 1954 was supposed to benefit all the citizens in the United States. It still have not benefited all of them, and back then it didn't benefit all of them. But what it did do, it brought an awareness that there was something going wrong, somebody wasn't doing what they were supposed to do, and with these men, they wanted it known personally that they were not getting what they were supposed to get out of the deal. Now, where there was a breakdown, I don't know. But somewhere along the line, there was a breakdown that it didn't filter down to everybody. And the same thing happens today, even with the city, with the uh, Civil Rights Administration. That is a part that has still not reaped any benefits of that right. Because there's a breakdown always before it reaches the person that needs it the most. Don't you think so? Yeah, I think so. You were saying about that strike. Did you ever? Oh, let's wait till the president. Now, in 1933, I was only three years old, so I don't know anything about the strike or anything. But after I got this letter, one day I was sitting talking with my mother about the letter. Wait, wait. After, you, after you started looking for yeah, people looking for the, the people who wrote the letter. Okay, so say that. I, all right. One day after I got started looking for the people that wrote the letter. Okay. We're just gonna sit. We're gonna sit up. Okay. In 1933, I was only three years old. But after Connie handed me this letter, and Connie's my niece who works with PPP, handed me this letter, and I went around looking for some of these people and couldn't find anybody but Myrtle, I decided to ask my mother if she knew any of these folk, because my mother's 87 years old. And I figured she might know some of them. And in talking with her, she says, yeah. She said, I remember when they had the strike. And that was the first I had heard of a strike. And she told me that during the strike, they opened the union store, and the people were allowed to go there and get grocery. And she did go to the union store one time. She also related to me an incident of one lady who did never go to the store, but she did washing and ironing for the white people who worked in Cannon Mill. And they gave her the stuff that they got at the union store. So what she did, she went and bought a calf and fed the stuff to the calf in order to make the calf fat enough that she killed the calf and then she had some meat to go along <laughs> with her food. But my mother was saying that they brought the National Guard in and they put the National Guard up on the tops of the building with guns to make sure that the workers would get back and forth to work without anybody doing any harm to them and that the men who worked in the mill that were black would have to take the water up on top of the mill to give to the guards whenever they wanted a drink. And I suppose that was because that the blacks being the most low paid and servant type folk, it was a better job for them to take the water than it was for the white folk to take the water up there. That was again a control thing 
and a thing of saying, you are below my station. And I think that was the whole thing in a nutshell with Cannon Mills. It was always, and even in, she mentioned earlier about the Cannon Mills houses. In the Cannon Mills houses, most of the houses that were built for the blacks in, that Cannon Mills has in Kannapolis were only three room houses. There was a bedroom, a living room, and a kitchen. And you paid for that. And at the time I remember, my father was paying 75 cents per week per room. Now, I don't know why, but all of the houses I know of in Kannapolis that were built for blacks were only three rooms. Where for the whites, they built four and five room houses. And if you go to Kannapolis now and look around, you can see all of these houses that were built for blacks. You can see all the houses that were built for whites. Uh, I was one of those who lived in a cannon mill house. I lived in a cannon mill house until after I graduated from high school. The time I graduated from high school, at that time, we were living in a four-bedroom home. There were nine children at our house, plus mother and father. And what did it mean to, uh, for you to, to what did it, you know what, you have a leaf on your hand. Yeah. Uh, 